My name is Bill Wilcox, William J. Wilcox, Jr. And how do you spell Wilcox? W-I-L-C-O-X. Why was Oak Ridge chosen for the Manhattan Project? Well, it was, it was one of the first actions of the uh, uh, New Manhattan uh, project under uh, Colonel Marshall in the uh, early summer of uh, 1942. And they started looking for a place to build these plants that they were going to have to have. And uh, uh, they, of course, knew at the time that they were going to follow two uh, courses to the bomb, the plutonium option and the uranium-235 option, but they had no idea what process was going to be used to separate the isotopes uh, or how big these production reactors were going to be. They just knew that they had to have a site somewhere to do this, all of this work, and they soon settled on the T Tennessee Valley region. And... Uh, uh, they started down close to what's now Watts Bar Dam, but uh, uh, they gradually came up the river and settled on this uh, uh, area that we're uh, in today, the Oak Ridge Reservation. Uh, their criteria were that they, they wanted a lot of land because they didn't have any idea how big these plants were going to be. So... The reason they settled here was that they, first of all, needed about 60,000 acres. Uh, when General Groves looked at it uh, in September, he immediately decided that he would not put the production reactors here. But when it was first picked out, the site was to be the, for the whole Manhattan Project, the uh, uranium enrichment the production reactors, and the bomb laboratory. Uh, so back in May, though, when they were really settling on this site, they wanted about 60,000 acres to do the job. They wanted a place where they had uh, good electrical power, and we had TVA here then. They wanted some place that was sparsely settled so they didn't have a huge problem moving out of town or moving out lots of people. Here there were just a thousand farms in this 60,000 acres. They wanted, a, however, to be close to a, a good labor supply, and they were only 13 miles from Knoxville, so that was a real, a real plus also. They wanted cooling water uh, for their reactors if they needed them or for the diffusion plant, and they had the Clinch River uh, surrounding those. Uh, they wanted good rail service, and we had two fine railroads serving the uh, area. So those were the uh, main criteria. Also, uh, a sign of the times, they wanted to be far enough from the coast, the Atlantic coast, uh, which during 1942 uh, was completely overrun by German submarines, the U-boats controlled the Atlantic, and they wanted to be far enough from the coast so they didn't have to worry about the U-boat uh, threat. Uh, but the topography, uh, the final uh, selling point, uh, the topography, of the geology of the place was just very attractive to them because in East Tennessee, the feature of the landscape uh, is long, low, parallel ridges, about a 1,000 feet tall, uh, with valleys in between. And uh, they're just one right after another. It's like you took a damask linen tablecloth and, and, and put your hands on a slick surface and, and push it this way, and it comes up in long folds. What this meant was they could put the town in one valley and the plants in another valley, and... Uh, uh, that would make them easier to uh, build fences and safeguard and secure a place. But of in, the, in the event of some untoward accident to one of the plants, it wouldn't wipe out the town at the same time. Uh, in other words, provide a little natural barrier. So those are the reasons that they selected Oak Ridge. Now, and, and Colonel Marshall had his people studying the site all 
summer long. They did one study after another of this feature and that feature, and uh, could we do this and could we do this, so on and so on. When General Groves took over the project in September, uh, he came down here and characteristically decided in one day, let's acquire the land. He, he didn't want to do any more studies, no more, didn't want to do any more planning, but he also decided right then and there that it was entirely too close to Knoxville for the production reactors, uh, that uh, uh, traces of radioactivity would undoubtedly get to Knoxville and give away the secret of what we are doing here. And so he wanted to put it somewhere. And instead of 60,000 acres, uh, his people went out to Washington State and got 500,000 acres uh, for their uh, wonderful production reactors. When Oppenheimer was first approached by uh, General Groves and told that uh, he wanted him to uh, be responsible for the bomb laboratory, and where would he like to have it? And by the way, we have this site in East Tennessee. Oppenheimer immediately said no, he didn't want that. So it turns out that the site was used primarily for the uh, isotope separation plant. decided what ways to get this isotope separated, why they, you know, how they well, began to do it. Well, <clears throat> uh, this problem that Oak Ridge was given, the mission of Oak Ridge, was to uh, follow this route to the bomb, which the physicists in 1939, 1940, felt was the most direct uh, route to the bomb. And, and because if they could just possibly get their hands on a couple of hundred pounds of pure U-235, uh, they could create a chain reaction by assembling a supercritical mass, and the neutrons created would form a chain reaction and result in the release of energy from the nucleus, the atomic bomb. Uh, and and it, sounds just, it sounds just great. But some physicists said, uh, you don't know what you're talking about. Uh, separating the isotopes of a, such a heavy element is, is, is probably something we'll never learn how to do. Uh, we might not even be able to do it because it's an incredibly difficult job. The uh, reason is, of course, that uh, uh, you can't separate isotopes the way you separate uh, the other, other elements. Uh, like separating iron from iron ore. Uh, you give that job to a chemist or a metallurgist, and uh, uh, it, it may be difficult, but it can certainly be done, and people have been doing it for uh, centuries, iron from iron ore, aluminum from aluminum ore. But separating uranium or other elements, isotopes, uh, is extraordinarily difficult because these two forms of uranium that... Uh, you dig out of the ground uh, are identical in uh, the way they act in any chemical reaction. Uh, uh, anything you do to it and make metal out of it or make liquid out of it or make gases out of it, uh, both of the forms of uranium uh, just go along with each other. There is no separation that occurs in any of these normal stuffs. I like to illustrate the uh, difference between the, the uh, isotopes, which is only in weight, in just, in just how much they weigh. If you take two identical basketballs, and uh, you ask me to uh, show you the difference in weight, all I have to do is to uh, scotch tape a nickel to one of those basketballs. And that's the relative difference between U-235, which you can make a bomb out of, and U-238, which you can't make a bomb out of. And 
so how do you separate these two things? Now, these are atoms, not basketballs. Uh, it's an extraordinary job. You have to, you have to do, invent some process uh, that uh, distinguishes, has them make, has them work a little bit differently because this one is just a little bit different in weight. And uh, that is, had never been done in 1939 with an element anywhere near uh, that heavy. It had been done. Uh, uh, by Professor Urey with uh, uh, heavy water uh, and regular water, uh, heavy hydrogen and light hydrogen. But there the difference in weight is tremendous uh, relative to the uh, weight of the atom. Um, and Jesse Beams at the University of Virginia had separated the isotopes of chlorine, 35 and 37. Um, but there again, the relative difference is pretty huge. But here you're talking about 235, 238, where the difference is very, very, very small. So you ask what uh, processes did they think about? And the word is think about because nobody had done it. Uh, and so the question was, you know, how could we possibly do this? Um, one of the first methods that was suggested by the British was uh, one called gaseous diffusion. And uh, there, uh, what you do is you take advantage of the fact that a gas, uh, where all the molecules are at the same temperature, uh, they are moving uh, uh, at slightly different speeds. If the uh, uh, one molecule is a little bit, little bit lighter than another. So the U-235 uh, in, in a gaseous uh, mixture, the U-235s are going to be moving just a little bit faster. And uh, if you uh, provide a uh, structure where it is diffusing through small holes, and I mean tiny, 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 tiny holes, uh, you might be able to get a little bit more of the 235 through there than the 238. It's not a sieve, it's a molecular interaction. Another process that somebody uh, knew about from uh, work that had been done years before was thermal diffusion. And uh, there you use liquid. Uh, and here you've got to use liquid uranium hexafluoride gas, which is a extremely uh, difficult <laughs> material to work with. It's almost as bad as gaseous uranium hexafluoride. But uh, under high pressure, real high pressure, and very high temperature, if you have a uh, uh, thermal gradient across a liquid stream of UF6, there is a uh, difference in the rate at which this material will uh, diffuse because it's a little bit lighter than the uh, liquid UF6. 238 at 6. Um, there was another process. Uh, uh, I mentioned Jesse Beams had separated chlorine. He did that with a gas centrifuge and um, a long cylinder that he spun at extremely high speeds. And the uh, heavier chlorine uh, 37 gas uh, and there, moves under centrifugal force like a whip at an amusement park, whoosh, lots of force. That 37 goes out a little farther than the uh, uh, 235. And so they said, well, maybe we can make that work with uh, uh, uranium. And uh, in 1940, uh, Dr. Beams at the University of Virginia started seeing if he couldn't do it with uh, uh, uranium hexafluoride. So there were these, those three main processes. Then in 1940, uh, uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Lawrence at the University of California, who had invented the cyclotron for spinning uh, nuclear particles, uh, suggested that that might be a way. He might be able to modify 
a cyclotron uh, so that he could start spinning, uh, if you will, or just uh, accelerating uh, a gas with the 235 and 238 in it so that you could spin this uh, under a magnetic field instead of a running it around in a whirling uh, metal cylinder like a gas centrifuge. And so he suggested that uh, we modify a uh, cyclotron to do this. And uh, he was very enthusiastic and uh, an optimist and uh, a brilliant physicist with a team of um, marvelous uh, associates. And uh, by 1942, when the Manhattan Project came along and got serious about doing this on a large scale, that was added to these other uh, three processes as a candidate. And uh, by then, uh, uh, Ernest Lawrence and his team had, had, had designed a specially new physics gadget that they, where they turned the kind of cyclotron sort of up on its side and have magnetic field uh, going in this direction and the uh, uh, uranium uh, gas, in this case uranium uh, tetrachloride, UCL4, uh, introduced at the bottom, uh, ionized with an electron beam and then accelerated out of this slit but in the magnetic field so that both of the uh, U-235 beam and the 238 beam are forced to curve in a circle. Then up at the top, he put a uh, receiver with slits in it, and uh, again, the uh, 238s take a larger radius of curvature and go into a slit up at the top of this eight-foot-tall machine uh, separated from the U-235 uh, beam by maybe a quarter of an inch or so. <coughs> there again, uh, the simple theory, the simple concept sounds uh, not too difficult. No, it sounds pretty, sounds pretty reasonable, but boy, putting it into action uh, just was an incredibly difficult uh, job. And uh, uh, at the end of the year, 1942, General Groves was in a position got his advisory council together, and he said, look, if this is going to make a difference in this war that President Roosevelt wants, we have got to make a decision. We can't just let these scientists keep working in these uh, different universities, uh, trying to improve and improve and improve and improve and make this better, better, better. We're going to have to pick how we're going to go. Uh, each one of the uh, processes had its strong advocates, uh, but they were all honest physicists, and uh, they all had to admit that they couldn't guarantee success. And uh, uh, so Groves was left uh, just having to make a decision uh, between these uh, competing processes, each of which had its attractions and its uh, liabilities, each one of which was a gamble. Um, and uh, his choice was that, uh, uh, first of all, he ruled out uh, thermal diffusion because it looked uh, extraordinarily difficult, both experimentally and theoretically. Uh, uh, and he, he stopped work on that. And, uh, but the U.S. Navy continued working on that. Dr. Philip Ab Abelson uh, kept working on that, but it was not part of the Manhattan Project. The uh, second one that he ruled out was the gas centrifuge. And there it was not because of the theory, which looked solid, and there's no question about it, but the mechanical difficulties were extraordinary. You have to have Jesse Beams's machine in 1942 had bearings at both ends that had to be lubricated 
because this thing is spinning uh, many, many miles per hour, rotational speed, uh, duraluminum cases, extremely beautifully uh, uh, machined so that they're perfectly balanced. Uh, you can't, and you can't have any bearings like having a ceiling fan. You can't have any wobble. This thing has got to be almost perfect, perfectly balanced. And then you've got these very difficult bearings at the top and the bottom, which had to be lubricated. <clears throat> with the oils in there, you've got to separate that from UF6, which reacts violently with oils. Uh, the mechanical problems were just enormous. And uh, so that left him with uh, gas fusion and the electromagnetic process, the uh, University of California process. And uh, of, of all the... Uh, uh, of all the, uh, of, of those two processes, gaseous fusion and uh, the uh, electromagnetic, it, it seemed to, it seemed to him and to his advisory committee that the California process was uh, the bet, the best bet, uh, because the gaseous fusion process, which also in theory is solid, uh, but they. The, the, the key to the gaseous fusion process is this, this little thing I told you that got all these holes in it that the molecules are going to bounce through. And nobody, uh, by the end of 1942, had made a piece of this porous material that was worth a, a tinker's, uh, well, uh, that, was, that was any good. I mean, it just, they were brittle and they had holes in them, pinholes in them. The British were working on it, and we were exchanging information, technical information with the British. But the British couldn't do it, and we couldn't do it either, in spite of the fact that the scientists at Columbia University who started working on this porous uh, material with the holes in it, which uh, we have since come to call barrier, that, which is the key to this process, having a, a material with all these holes in it, uh, even though they started in 1940, 41, 42, um, they still hadn't made a barrier that was any good. And uh, uh, of course, I'm, a I'm an old research and development man myself, you know, and success is always around the corner. And we never run out of ideas and something else to try. And of course, that's the way they talked in 42, too, also. Uh, so he decided to put his main efforts on the California process, which was admittedly a gamble, but worth doing because if there's any way we could uh, develop a, a method, put this to work and get some U-235, a couple of hundred pounds, we might make a real difference in ending the war. So that's the story about the selection of those uh, uh, two processes. He, he he went to work right away in '43, uh, designing and building uh, the California uh, process plant at Oak Ridge, which uh, was codenamed Y12, and uh, had a thousand when we got through with Y12. Uh, th got through building it in two years. Uh, it had uh, 1,152 of these uh, uh, University of California designed uh, machines, which they named Calutrons, the Cal, Cal for California, and Tron for Cyclotrons, and U, Calutron University, California. California University, Cyclotrons, Calutrons, and, uh, but designed specifically for uh, separating uranium isotopes, and they worked beautifully. Uh, it was a, a fantastic gamble and a monumental achievement uh, when you think that they broke ground in February of 42, 43, excuse me. The decision was made to go ahead with it in December of 42. And that project started in the summer of 42. Groves took over in September. In December, made the decision to go with the 
uh, the uh, Calutron, and they broke ground in February before they even had a design for the equipment. They got Stolen Webster in as an AE, told them to build uh, the plant uh, and make, well, how many buildings do you want? Well, I'm not really sure, but let's build them. Well, how big? Well, they need to be big enough so that, uh, and so on, and so on, and so on. <laughs> Just did a fantastic job. Uh, the machines had to have uh, uh, the heart and soul of that machine, you see, with these huge electromagnets, eight feet tall, with iron cores all wound with some conductor. And uh, as soon as they start talking about where they're going to get these magnets, somebody said, well, wait a minute, you, we got a war going on. said, you can't possibly, uh, uh, you can't possibly get the thousands of tons of copper wire that you have to have to wind these uh, magnet cores. I said, it'll, 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 it'll shut down our production of tanks and uh, airplanes, motors, every motor that we put in a, uh, vehicles for the uh, war effort uh, has to have copper windings. And uh, somebody said, uh, well, silver's a better conductor than copper. Uh, why don't we use silver? Well, where are we going to get silver? Well, the government's got tons of it sitting in bank vaults up there at West, not bank vaults, the uh, West Point Repository for silver up in on the Hudson River. We've got uh, tons of ingots sitting up there. Hey, that's a great idea. So Colonel Nichols, who was in charge of the uh, uh, Oak Ridge operations, uh, went up to uh, Washington and sat down with Under Secretary Bell and, uh, of the Treasury and said, we've got a secret project. I can't tell you what it is, but we'd like to borrow some silver. And by borrowing silver from the uh, vaults, and we're going to keep it under lock and key, bar bar fences. We promise that we'll give it back as soon as the war's over. It'll make a huge contribution to the uh, a war effort as a substitute material. And uh, Under Secretary Bell said, well, of course, and uh, we know about substitute materials. Uh, uh, my wife's using margarine. We don't have any butter and so on. Silver for copper sounds like a good deal. So how much do you want? Uh, Colonel Nichols said, well, we're, we're thinking about uh, somewhere like maybe uh, uh, a few thousand tons. And Bell just jumped up from his chair. He said, Colonel Nichols, he said, here at the Treasury Department, we do not talk about silver in terms of tons. Our unit of measurement is troy ounces. And uh, so Colonel Nichols said, well, he said, I'll... I'll, I'll figure out how many troy ounces that is. And of course, it's about 300 million troy ounces or something. But we ended up at Y-12 borrowing from the Treasury uh, 14,000 tons of silver. And those ingots were taken out and, and uh, shipped under guards and, and uh, so on uh, and rolled into uh, uh, sheets and made into bus bars and wound, wound, windings for all these uh, uh, 1152 magnet cores, or the cores for the, the magnets for these uh, uh, units at Y-12, 14,000 tons, uh, $300 million worth at that time, uh, out of the Treasury Reserves. And uh, General Groves insisted they keep very good uh, track of it, uh, all of the uh, machine turnings, uh, dust and so on was all collected and accounted for and weighed. And after the war, it was all taken apart and given back to the Treasury. And General Groves in later years uh, bragged about, uh, I can't remember the figure right now, but it was well over 99% of the silver was turned back. You have things like that going on. You have 25,000 workers, construction workers, in the middle of 1943. I said they broke ground in February. By summer, they had 25,000 construction workers at the Y-12 site building that plant and designing it 
and uh, I'm designing pieces and building it all along. Uh, what an accomplishment. By November, it's hard to believe, but by November, the first Calutron was ready to get started in operation. Groundbreaking in February with the designs unsure, uncertain at all. And uh, by golly, by, by November of that same year, they had the building up, all the infrastructure, all the diffusion pumps, all of the electrical supplies, and they were actually able to start running uh, a machine. Uh, it was a disaster. The magnets shorted out and uh, uh, came to a screeching halt. Uh, <clears throat> General Groves had insisted that they just go ahead and uh, they didn't have time to set up and run a pilot plant of these Calutron units. Uh, Groves said, look, this is a war. We've got to beat Germany to the bomb. Uh, we'll do the experimenting on the plant. So even though he was very unhappy with the uh, uh, fact that the machines didn't run well, uh, the first time, uh, he said, uh, let's shut her down, figure out what's the matter. They found that the magnet coils were too close together and there was dirt and the oil hadn't been cleaned well enough and so on and so on. So they figured out what the fixes would be, uh, sent uh, some of the magnets back to Alice Chalmers in Milwaukee to get them uh, rewound. But there were lots of other magnets in the production cycle stream, you see, in the production process. So they fixed those right up there at the time. And so by January, November, December, January, uh, they had new type, they had calutrons going in somewhere else in the plant, somewhere else in the uh, production cycle. Because I said there were eight, over 800 of them in the uh, big machines and the alpha machines, 400 and the smaller machines. So that in January they were ready with uh, the uh, machine that had been fixed and they ran those uh, uh, pretty much close to the end of January, I think January 27th or so was the actual date. And the uh, top brass and plant Tennessee Eastman officials and the Army officials came and watched the first run, and it was a success. And so then it was just a matter of bringing more calutrons on stream, and that happened all through 1944. So the first production run really that worked was in January of 44. But when you look at it now in hindsight, from where they started in February or even January of 43, uh, to us today, it just, it, 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 it almost seems unbelievable. It's a remarkable accomplishment. I arrived in uh, uh, October of 1943, uh, before they started the Calutron operation in 19, but I was in the chemistry end, which was a different, entirely different part of Y-12. And I knew nothing at all about the calutrons, the magnets, the silver. No, they were just those big red buildings and I had no idea uh, what was going on in those big red buildings. Uh, I was a chemist and I was in the uh, chemistry building, which was finished in October of 43. And what I mean by finished is I'm the outside walls and the uh, inside the heating, there wasn't any cooling, the uh, heating system and sewers and so on and so on. Uh, that was all ready for us in uh, October. So uh, those of us who were hired out of the college graduating classes of 1943, the spring classes, uh, Tennessee Eastman, and as a matter of fact, all the other men had project contractors all over the country, scoured the graduating classes 1943 and picked up all the chemists, chemical engineers, physicists, uh, electrical engineers, mechanicals, any, anybody with technical backgrounds. And uh, they hired us all. We went to work. I went to work in May 
of 43. Um, and as I said, groundbreaking here for the first plant was in February. For, so, so there wasn't anywhere for us to come in Oak Ridge. So they shipped us all somewhere else. And Eastman, Tennessee Eastman's people all went to Eastman Kodak in Rochester, New York. And that's where I spent the summer along with, uh, I guess, 40 or 50 other college graduates. And we were working in Eastman Kodak's laboratories under lock and locked key in their beautiful uh, research building they call Kodak Park in Rochester. The uh, Kodachrome uh, developing laboratories for the whole country were in the first floor, ground floor, and we were up on the second floor. Uh, and we spent the summer learning uranium chemistry, uh, developing our own understanding of how to separate it from uh, uh, when we when when we get impure uranium, get the uh, uranium two thirty five that is uh, enriched in these calutrons, uh, you can't make bomb grade material in one step in a calutron. You get a lot of separation uh, in that first step, but the most the highest enrichment you can achieve there in that first step was about 15%, 10 to 15%. Not enough to make a bomb out of. We had uh, uh, these big eight-foot units. We had about eight, over 800 of those in uh, a series of uh, four different buildings. But then we had a second stage called the beta calutrons. Those were half as big. And... Uh, you put the 15% material into that, and what you get out is 80% 80, 80 enriched plus 80 to 90%. Uh, and that's what you want for the bomb. So, so really you have these two stages. Uh, but the chemists are needed because when this stuff comes out of the alpha units, uh, you have to... You have to scrape it or dissolve it or uh, dig it or something, get it out of the units, and uh, then it gets all uh, junked up, contaminated with, uh, uh, if you use nitric acid, for example, to make sure you get every bit off of the stainless steel, what that means is you end up with a solution, and your U-235, uh, if, if you use nitric acid, your U-235 uh, uh, nitrate, uh, uranyl nitrate, uh, comes along with uh, uh, contamination by iron and nickel and copper and molybdenum and all the other elements that are in stainless steel. So the chemists have to purify, get chemical standpoint, you see, get the uranium away from those other elements, make it real pure, uh, and then convert it to uranium tetrachloride, and it's a long series of chemical steps to purify it and convert it to uranium tetrachloride now, uh, which is exactly like the uranium tetrachloride over here. When you go to the alpha uh, calutron, chemically it's exactly the same, but the isotopically this is now 15% instead of 7 tenths of a percent, and the product is the... Uh, what you want, the bomb level, highly enriched uranium. So that's what we learned to do all summer and came down here and uh, went to work doing it on a, uh, uh, getting ready to do it on a production scale. But as I said, I got down here in October, uh, we had to uh, buy all the laboratory equipment and get it all set up and continued our research and development, you see before we ever started getting any material to really work with, you see, until the January and February of the next year. But the chemists, uh, it was a major effort. And uh, uh, by the time Y-12 got into full production in the uh, spring of 1945 is when we made the... <coughs> bulk of the material for the uh, first atomic bomb. 
there were trickles all through uh, 44 uh, going to Los Alamos, but uh, most of it went in the fall of 44 and the spring of 1945. That's when most of the uh, U-235 was produced and shipped out to uh, uh, Los Alamos. Uh, and at that time, Y-12's employment cadre was up to 22,400 people in one plant. And, and goodness sakes, uh, it, it's more than work in the plants in Oak Ridge today, all of Y-12s. It just, it was a busy, busy, busy place. And uh, uh, many of them, I, I don't know what the fraction is, I, I'm tempted to say about half of them were involved in the chemical end of it, the other half in production, support, so on. So that's why 12's uh, uh, story, the, uh, 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 it was, it was just, it was just an amazing place. The uh, materials and the supplies that went in there, two uh, Y twelve to build the uh, buildings, uh, uh, just came in box car after box car. Somebody said that the total uh, railroads shipments into Oak Ridge Reservation in those early wartime years were three thousand box cars full of lumber and concrete and supplies and iron and steel and everything else. 3,000 boxcars a month, and they all went out empty. And the uh, uh, railroad people kept wondering, you know, well, what's going on here? So <laughs> just month after month after month after month, and we don't get anything out. And, of course, people in town, you know, they didn't see any trucks going out. And... Uh, I guess the people in Oak Ridge, uh, uh, most anybody would have thought, well, boy, they would have been terribly disappointed to learn that the total product of this huge outfit was going out in an attache case a couple of times a week, uh, chained to a wrist of a military uh, security lieutenant dressed in plain clothes with a couple of plain clothes guards going with him. And, of course, the reason is that what you're doing is just taking that uh, small amount of U-235 in the original uranium ore that you dig out of the ground. Uh, if you dig out 1,000 pounds, you only get 7 pounds of 235. And 1,000 pounds. So the damn stuff is scarce as hen's teeth. So that when you get it pure, you see, you, you're... You process, you process up lots and lots of this stuff coming in, and of course then you've got process inefficiencies, so you don't get anywhere near 100% of the stuff out, and you have a lot of process losses all along, so that you really feed a tremendous amount of stuff into this process and get a tiny little bit out. Uh, and... Uh, by the uh, uh, spring of 1945, uh, every bit that went to Los Alamos was going out uh, in these uh, uh, little nickel cans about the size of a, a coffee cup, a little nickel can, heavily plated with gold on the inside. Uh, and it went in the form of uh, uranium tetrafluoride, a salt, uh, pretty green, blue-green salt crystals, and uh, and uh, highly purified from a chemical standpoint as well as from an isotopic standpoint, eighty percent plus U two thirty five, and. Uh, uh, the research chemists at Y-12 took that precious product and converted it to uranium tetrafluoride, which would make it very easy for the Los Alamos people to reduce it to uh, metal, turn it into uranium metal, what they needed the machine to 
uh, make the parts for the little boy bomb. And so we sent it as uranium tetrafluoride in these uh, little cans and uh, screwed a lid on top of them and uh, put two of them in one of these attitude cases if they had that much material to deliver and sent it out. And uh, so I think most people in Oak Ridge would be quite distressed to know that uh, all this effort was producing just that little, little dab of stuff. But of course, after over a period of, uh, of six months, uh, seven months, eight months, well, yeah, we produced some all through 1944, and uh, then the rest of it through uh, uh, the first six months of uh, 1945. And uh, by July, Los Alamos finally had enough to uh, make the uh, first atomic bomb with the uh, little boy bomb. And uh, so Y-12 uh, achieved its uh, almost uh, impossible mission. Uh, the General Grove set for it in making, uh, uh, separating the uh, isotopes of, of uranium uh, and doing this in two and a half years. Uh, almost incredible mission. Can you talk a little bit about um, K-25? Yes. Uh, as I said, that uh, go back to December 42 when Groves is picking between the processes, the people at the Columbia University uh, and the British overseas had urged that uh, gaseous diffusion, the theory was uh, better known and, uh, or, or let's just say not better known, but let's say well known. And uh, if they could just get their hands on this barrier material, that uh, uh, it, it would be a, probably an even better process than the calutron. Uh, from an engineer's standpoint, you see, the, the calutron process is what we call a batch process. I said you had to put some uranium tetrachloride in the bottom and heat it up and vaporize it and then it comes out at the top. Well this machine runs for about three or four or five days and then it runs out of this. You've ended up vaporizing all the UCL4 down there. So you have to take the machine apart, break the vacuum, pull the machine out. you got 800 of these things so you've got people running all over the place, taking these things apart, putting them back together, and so on and so on and so on. People, 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 people. And uh, a batch process, because now you have to load them up again, run it for four or five more days and stop it, and charge it up again, and so on. Gaseous diffusion process, the, the concept is that you uh, you put this gas through this membrane, this barrier material, and uh, you get a separation. Uh, and that's nice. If, if, if everything works right, you get a little bit of separation each stage. But that's the hooker. Uh, you get uh, a very small amount of separation. So what you have to do is to take that gas that you get out after passing it through one time and then put it through a another stage. And when you put it through another stage, uh, every time you go through the barrier, l you lose pressure. You have to put pressure here to get the gas to come through. So that now you have to take this gas and pump it up again and run it through another barrier. And uh, so on and so on. Well, how many times do you have to do this? Well, it tur turns out about 3,000. So that you've got to have a huge number of these tanks with these barriers in it and compressors and valves to control the pressure and gas coolers to take the heat of compression out of the gas at each stage so it doesn't keep getting hotter and hotter and hotter. 
So you end up with a mammoth plant because you have to do this 3,000 <coughs> pardon me 3,000 times. So this gaseous diffusion plant, if they could ever get the barrier, John Grove said, this could be a better, because all we do is we switch on the plant and it just runs. We don't have to take this apart and fix it every time. <coughs> so here's, a, uh, here's, here's, here's the great benefit if we can make this work. <coughs> so Groves decided, General Groves, and his top policy committee decided that what they would do is get the Y-12 plant in there. That was their first sure bet. Uh, that was surely their first good bet. Uh, I want to emphasize how much of a risk these people, Vannevar Bush and J.B. Conant and uh, Groves, uh, the rest of these intellectual giants and leadership giants were taking because it was a it was just a real gamble but what they were saying was that y12 is is our best bet and then let's hedge that by starting the gaseous fusion plant and since these guys can't make one of these barriers yet let's give them as much time as we can so he didn't start it for another year after Y-12. Actually, ground was broken in September of 43. Uh, ground for Y-12 was broken in February, and I mentioned that the first units were actually uh, started up in November. Well, now, K-25 was started in September, groundbreaking. Uh, but its first units didn't start operating until January of 45, you see. So it was a year behind uh, Y-12. And again, Groves and those, Groves and those people, uh, uh, when they start talking to the engineers about this K-25 plant, <coughs> they found out that they were talking about building a building to house all of these uh, tanks that are going to have this barrier material in them. They call them diffusers. 3,000 of them. The building was going to take 40 acres of ground, and it all needed to be under one roof, and it all needed to be hot so that the UF-6 didn't condense and turn into a solid. And uh, that is just the beginning of the difficulties that these engineers faced in building the gaseous fusion plant. Uh, not just the beginning, uh, but they did uh, take that uh, risk. They made that decision. They started building. And again, the civil engineers, the people that built the building, uh, they could do that. They, they leveled out the ground perfectly and because and, they couldn't have the any settlement cracks going on, all these pipes in there. Uh, <laughs> but the barrier material that uh, is the key to the whole thing was never developed until uh, the summer of 44. And by then, Groves, the building was already pretty much, uh, well, it was completely committed to, and it was about... Uh, almost half built. Uh, they had to go ahead and build all this stuff, and order these compressors, and order the tanks and all this stuff, and the guys in the laboratory are still not able to make this uh, barrier material. This is an incredible, uh, I keep hating to use that word, but, but uh, it just jumps out at you when you look at the job that they had to do. This barrier material has got to have holes in it. I said uh, very small holes, uh, very, very small holes, uh, small enough so that in, in a square centimeter, say the size of your thumbnail, you have a, over 100 million holes 
in an area the size of your thumbnail. And you've got to have acres of this stuff. And the holes all have to be the same size. If they're too big, these tiny little holes, if they're too big, the gas just flows through them. You get no separation at all. If they're too small, the gas condenses on the walls and it flows through the hole as a liquid and you get no separation at all. So they all got to be the same size. You can't have any pinholes. A terrible job. And you've got to have this flexible. You've got to be able to move it, bend it around, make different shapes out of it, you know. It's got to be strong, in other words. You've got to have strength so that you put pressure on one side and pump it through something. Uh, oh, and by the way, th this has to be chemically resistant to uranium hexafluoride, which is a real nasty corrosive material. Because if you have any corrosion taking place, over a period of time, those little holes will get a little bit bigger. Or maybe they'll cl plug up. So you can't have that. Oh, and yeah, I forgot to mention, uh, uh, b by the way, we can't have any air leaking into this plant. This is all going to be uh, under vacuum. And when they told the construction contractor that this whole building, the 300 miles of piping, all this stuff, had to be just as vacuum tight as a thermos bottle, the uh, construction contractor said, I, I can't imagine anything like that. And then they told him, oh yeah, by the way, we can't have any oil or uh, uh, organic material. Uh, for example, no fingerprints on the inside of that piping. So that every time you turn around, uh, this corrosive UF6 gas, the fact that you can't have any holes in the piping anywhere, that air will leak in because air brings moisture in. And moisture reacts instantly with UF6 vapor and turns it into uh, uh, uranium oxyfluoride, UO2F2, which is a beautiful yellow material, but it's a solid. In other words, if you let any air, just the moisture in this room's air, if you let it into a tank of UF6, it hydrolyzes UF6, turns it into this nice yellow smoke, and it plugs the holes. So we can't have any holes. And this 40-acre plant. Uh, so I think it's just amazing that uh, Groves would uh, uh, take, take that chance. The engineers just did a brilliant, absolutely brilliant job. Kellex Corporation, uh, Manson Benedict, uh, Doby Keith were the, probably the lead engineers. They just did an absolutely uh, fantastic job of uh, designing this uh, K25U. And uh, Jay Jones, a construction contractor from Charlotte, North Carolina, did a fantastic job of building it. It cost $512 million to build that plant. Uh, uh, probably six or seven billion dollars today. And it was done in 18 months. And by golly, right from the beginning, it worked. Absolutely beautiful. Groves bought, brought, says afterwards, uh, after the fact, uh, he said one time that it was probably his greatest uh, uh, gamble of the war. Uh, and he thought that uh, if they hadn't come through with that uh, barrier at the last minute, uh, he said the congressional investigation probably would have gone on for the rest of his life. And, uh, <laughs> but by golly, the thing worked. And because it was a continuous process, huh? they turned that switch on, and, and then they kept putting pieces, these, uh, these stages, they put more and more on stream over a period of a, a year and a half. And uh, uh, by the end of 1946, the top product enrichment at K25 was now at bomb level. And... Uh, Groves just instantly shut down Y-12. 
the uh, cost of making the stuff at uh, K25 was uh, less than 10 percent of what it was at Y12. It's just a much cheaper process. And uh, of course, the improvements that uh, uh, were made in the next decade in the expansion program, the arms race with Russia, uh, brought the cost way, way down below what it was for that uh, wartime plant and uh, made possible the civilian nuclear power reactors, which couldn't be, today would not be economically feasible at all with the uh, uh, original K-25 uh, process efficiencies. There was a uh, third isotope separation plant at uh, Oak Ridge, but it uh, had a lifetime of only about one year. And it, uh, some of us here at Oak Ridge feel like it's our forgotten story. Uh, but uh, in terms of our total costs, uh, it, really, it really didn't uh, uh, figure largely uh, in the Manhattan Project uh, Oak Ridge spent $1.1 billion by the end of 1945, uh, which, which is about 60 cents out of every Manhattan Project dollar, biggest part of the Manhattan Project. Now, at Oak Ridge, uh, when you look at the expenses, uh, uh, Y-12 was $478 million. So it's a huge plant, nearly half a billion dollars in wartime dollars. K-25 was a little more than that, 512 millions. Uh, X-10, which was uh, the uh, code name given to uh, the uh, production reactor that was built here by the uh, University of Chicago Met Lab, uh, Arthur Ali Compton and his great team at the University of Chicago, they first wanted to build that uh, production reactor right there in Argonne Forest. And uh, Groves and others, uh, DuPont, uh, uh, talk, talked them out of that. And, and so they put it down here on the uh, Oak Ridge Reservation, Clinton Engineer Works. That was the uh, reactor that they had to have, production reactor, that they had to have in order to get their hands on some gram quantities of plutonium so that Seaborg and his people, chemists, could develop the separation processes for the uh, Hanford plant, the uh, uh, separation of uh, plutonium from all the fission products uh, from the uh, reactor uh, slugs. Uh, so they had to have that, and, and so that graphite reactor was built here, and uh, it was our first success. Uh, it, just like Y-12, ground was broken in February of 43, right away. But of course, the Chicago people knew how to design that. They'd done the stag field, and they just uh, souped that up. Uh, but the theory was there, and uh, 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 some people wanted it built as a pilot scale for the pilot reactor for the Hanford, but uh, it was an air-cooled reactor, and uh, uh, as things worked out, they went to water cooling, so it really wasn't a uh, pilot plant, but it was a production plant, and uh, it went critical in November, uh, November the 4th. Uh, at the same time that uh, later that month that the first calutron was tried and it failed, uh, but the, the graphite reactor went critical November the 4th and it was a success from then on. And uh, all through the war they produced uh, plutonium. They produced a total of about seven-tenths of a pound uh, over the next uh, couple of years, two and a half years. And the uh, present uh, uh, Oak Ridge National Laboratory evolved out of that particular uh, 
X-10 operation, and that's where Oak Ridge National Laboratory is today. But during the war, compared to the two half-billion-dollar plants, the O&L cost $27 million. And the plant that I started telling you the story about, the S-50 plant, was $16 million. So it was a small piece uh, at Oak Ridge. Nevertheless, it was our third high school separation plant. The town cost uh, $96 million, and that makes up our uh, total of a little more than $1.1 billion. Get back to S-50. Uh, I mentioned earlier that when Groves was looking with his advisory committee at the possibilities, thermal diffusion was one as a process, and the Navy kept a small uh, program going on uh, thermal diffusion through the war. It was not part of the Manhattan Project, but they were very interested right from the beginning in the possibility of using a nuclear reactor to power submarines. And they knew that they were going to have to have highly enriched uranium as a fuel. And so that was their interest in uh, thermal diffusion. And Phil Abelson, a uh, brilliant researcher out of uh, uh, the University of California, uh, one of Lawrence's protégés, kept that uh, work going. And uh, uh, it, it, they got to the point in uh, uh, 1944 where Abelson started building a pilot plant uh, of a number of big thermal diffusion columns in Philadelphia Navy Yard up in Philadelphia. And uh, J. Robert Oppenheimer, who kept track with a lot of his old friends from California, uh, heard about what Abelson was doing. And of course, Oppenheimer was extremely interested in uh, doing whatever he could to increase the uh, quantities of U-235 that he, he could get for the first weapon. And uh, so it occurred to him that, uh, uh, by golly, uh, we might use a thermal diffusion plant to augment the output of the other two plants at Oak Ridge. And he went to Groves and uh, or Groves was talking to him all the time uh, in the course of uh, operations, the subject came up that uh, Oppie said, well, uh, General Groves, I understand you've got this power plant built up there uh, for the K-25 gaseous diffusion plant, but it's going to be done six months before your gaseous diffusion plant needs the power. Now, he's not talking about, Oppie was not talking about electric power. He was talking about the superheated steam that turns the generators to make the power. He says uh, to Groves, he says, hey, you're going to have this capability of putting out this 900-degree steam, and I know just who could use that steam to give you a little bit of enrichment. And so Groves perked up his ears, and... Um, uh, the upshot was that uh, Groves uh, said, hey, instead of building that pilot plant in the Philadelphia Navy Yard, let's build it down here at Oak Ridge, right by the steam plant. And uh, instead of just uh, what you're talking about there, let's build 20 of them. Because I don't want a pilot plant, I want a plant. And... Uh, he went to one of his great contacts uh, that he had known before in the construction business, uh, Ferkley, uh, Ferkley Company, H. H. K. Ferguson, excuse me, H. K. Ferguson, a great design architect engineer in Cleveland, Ohio, and uh, uh, H. K. Ferguson's widow was running the the firm, and he talked to her, and he said, this is, Groves does his uh, great 
uh, national uh, interests, vital war work speech to her. Uh, how about designing uh, this plant for us? And uh, this guy will tell you how to build these columns and so on and so on and so on. And uh, uh, incidentally, we need that plant uh, on stream in uh, 75 days. And uh, <laughs> uh, they got this. <laughs> They got this plant going, got this plant, the first column started in 69 days in 1944, right along the banks of the Clinch River, uh, across from what's now being developed as Rarity Ridge, uh, in a big uh, black tall building with 2,000 columns in it, thermal diffusion columns that uh, were so, the specs were so tight that even though they sent them out to something like 20 companies in the United States, there were only two companies that even responded. And uh, uh, the one of them was, uh, uh, that in, the, in the middle they have a uh, uh, nickel column. 45 feet long, this is a nickel pipe, 45 feet long, completely straight, absolutely straight. And uh, uh, outside of it is a copper tube, absolutely straight. And the gap between the nickel and the copper has to be exactly so many uh, tenths of an inch. I mean, this is very, very small. The uh, difference between the success of our plant, which was successful, and the Japanese that wasn't, and the German that wasn't, was that their gaps were a lot bigger than ours. Ours is a very small gap. But in that gap, you're going to put your liquid UF6 under high pressure. And inside the uh, nickel tube, you're going to run 900 degrees steam, high pressure steam. And then on the outside of the copper, you're going to run water from the river, say. Whew. So you have a tremendous temperature gradient across that. And the U-235, the UF-6 up at the top, the liquid UF-6, turns out have, will have a little higher UF, U-235 concentration than the UF-6 at the bottom. 45 feet, 2,000 of these. Incredible. All packed into this one building. And uh, I talked to... Uh, Somebody this summer uh, that was uh, here for our Secret City Festival, uh, he worked in the plant, and he said the noise was tremendous. I said, noise? I said, you don't have any compressors in there. He said, it leaks from the high-pressure steam. When that high-pressure steam finds a little bit of a hole and goes out, it either screams or it hollers or <laughs> terrific noise. Uh, the, the startup problems were huge, and uh, even though they got it started in uh, September or October of 1945, excuse me, misspoke, 1944, they built it during this summer, the 69-day period, was over, I think, in September. Uh, but they didn't really have the cascade on stream and start putting out product until early 45. And then the product concentration in U-235 enrichment was little under 1%. So this doesn't have a very large separation factor, not like the Calgatron, which go to or it wasn't really tiny like the gaseous fusion, but it was somewhere in between. But the plant got uh, put out product uh, of about 1%, and that was fed to uh, Y12, and then when K25 got going, when it was fed to K25. And uh, Y12, K25's product uh, started going to uh, Y12 also in uh, the uh, spring of 1945. But again, this was part of the big cascade. And uh, the enrichment level in the, uh, say, March or 
April of 45, which is the time that uh, uh, Whitewell was sending the uh, urgently needed 235 to Los Alamos, trying to build up enough of an inventory for that first bomb. Uh, it was one or two percent, you see. So K-25 and S-50, although you have to say that they contributed to the uh, U-235 that went into the first bomb, it, it wasn't a major contribution. Uh, Colonel Nichols and uh, uh, Richard Hewlett's great history of the Department of Energy, Hewlett and Anderson, uh, he says that, that uh, Colonel Nichols asked his production control committee to figure out after the war, so well, now how much of a contribution did S-50 make? And their answer was that it speeded up the time at which the uh, total amount of material required for the first bomb uh, was uh, achieved. It speeded that up by about nine days. I think in Hewlett and Anderson, I think that's what's in Nichols' book. Hewlett and Anderson, I think, say about a week. But uh, uh, when you look at the speeding it up by, say, a week, and you figure the cost of a war per day and compare that to $16 million, uh, there's no question about what S-50 was extremely worthwhile. The difficulties in running S-50 were sufficient so that uh, uh, one month after the war ended in August, in September that is to say, in September they pulled the chain on S-50 and shut it down in September of 45, you see, after it had run a total of uh, a year and but only part of that was really putting out uh, good product. But that's the S-50 story. The uh, only relic that is down there today that some of us uh, preservationists are, tr are trying to get saved, the only relic is two small smokestacks. And uh, <laughs> they are the remnants, the only thing left of the uh, even the K-25, the powerhouse, the powerhouse is completely gone, and uh, the S-50 plan is a green field. But there are two small stacks up there. Uh, you remember this, I was, I was telling about how Oppenheimer got Groves uh, interest aroused in using this plant before it was needed for K-25. And, and they did that. And, and, they accomplished that. But the time did come, halfway through that production period, when the K-25's team had to go to K-25 power to make K-25 power. So then what are you going to do? You're just going to, after this S-50 plant is all up and running, now you got to shut it. The Navy brought in, U.S. Navy sent in three boilers from destroyers and made a powerhouse to produce steam and set up a tank farm of, uh, for diesel oil. Uh, 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 there must be 10 or 20 of these huge tanks with dikes all around them. And that fed the uh, uh, three uh, boilers from destroyers that made the high pressure steam when the K-25 could no longer give them steam. They made their own steam. And these two smokestacks are right at the end of their uh, powerhouse, and it's the only thing that's left. It's a relic, and, uh, but I'd like to save them so that uh, we can mark the site of that uh, third fantastic accomplishment at Oak Ridge. I had one uh, uh, traumatic experience in my employment, I came very came with a whisker of getting fired. Uh, and uh, it was in uh, February of uh, 40, 44. I'd had very, uh, 
I've been very fortunate right from the beginning because I got in on the ground floor and I learned this uranium chemistry up in uh, Rochester. We couldn't get it out of books and there weren't consultants that knew all about uranium chemistry. There wasn't any internet. Uh, everything that had been published on uranium uh, was fed on two or three pages. So we really learned by experimental uh, uranium chemistry, how to test for it, uh, spot tests, and how to measure it, how to analyze for it. It was a uh, very intense learning experience that summer. And when we got to Oak Ridge, started hiring other people, of course, we ended up training all of them and ended up being the supervisors, the frontline foremen, uh, even though we were kids. Uh, our experience uh, qualified us. But uh, I was chosen uh, to handle a, uh, what I think now, looking back on it, I wasn't told at the time, uh, was probably the first uh, real quantity of uh, uh, enriched uranium to come out of the, the uh, uh, alpha calutrons, the ones that started in January. I think it was sometime in February, late February, um, and went right through my laboratory, the laboratory where I worked. And uh, I remember the boss impressing on me that this particular lot, which I think was about 200 grams, um, half a pound, uh, plus or minus, had to be handled with very, very great care. They wanted to be certain it didn't get contaminated. Now, what, you know, of course, what he's talking about is not just chemical contamination. What he's talking about is contaminated with other uranium, because we had uranium all over the place. But you can't tell whether it's enriched by looking at it. Now, you've got to label it and keep it separate and so on. We kept this separate. This was in a hood all by itself. No other uranium anywhere close to it and so on and so on. And uh, I followed it through the uh, uh, purification cycle and uh, that involved extraction and precipitation and so on. And finally end up uh, precipitating it with uh, uranium peroxide, uh, with hydrogen peroxide and uh, it produces a UO4 which is a uh, lemon colored, looks like lemon custard, beautiful precipitate, and then you uh, uh, filter it out. And uh, uh, for filters, in order to keep it pure and clean, we used what the chemists call a Buchner filter, which is Pyrex glass, and uh, used a brand new ones, all this brand new equipment, of course make sure that this just doesn't get contaminated in any way. But it's a glass funnel about this, about this big around and about that tall, and then it has a uh, uh, centered Pyrex fret in it, uh, a uh, porous material, very, very small holes, so that uh, the water goes through and this lemon custard sits up here on top of it. And so I got that all done and uh, sucked the uh, water out of it and got it ready. And then uh, the next step is to uh, put this in a real hot oven and uh, calcine it, convert it from UO4 to UO3. And then it goes into the next step. Well, I did all of that just, just fine. And uh, I can't remember exactly what the boss said, but I think he suggested that I stay with it all night to make sure that when it calcined, uh, everything worked well. And uh, I had done this many, many times. We had rehearsed all these things with just regular uranium so that we knew the chemical properties and so on and so on. 
So I'd done this many, many times. I thought, well, boy, this is going to work good. Uh, to make real sure that uh, uh, nothing breaks, I'm just going to just add, just provide a little extra uh, conservatism. I'm going to put this in a stainless steel can. And what we usually did was, in those early days is we put everything that was in glass, we put it in stainless cans underneath it so that if anything happens. Well, the Buchner funnel uh, has a bead at the top uh, of, of Pyrex glass, sort of a swollen ring around it at the top to make it a little stronger, and then one down here at the frit. And when it's set down in the uh, stainless steel funnel, this band here at the bottom, this little, this little extension here on the bottom of the funnel sat right down on my stainless steel. I said, oh boy, that's perfect. And uh, then the uh, tube sat down in the uh, stainless steel. I looked fine. So I stuck it in the oven and uh, calcined it, and it turned a uh, nice color like it does from that lemon custard to a nice deep yellow, nice powder, real pretty. So I said, well, that's just fine. Hell, I'm going home. I've got a date. So I turned off the oven, and then the next morning I came in, and somebody saw me and said, you better get the hell out of here. The boss is looking for you, and he's so mad he can spit. They're even talking about giving you the ax. I said, oh, my goodness, I'm going to go up and talk to him. He said, I wouldn't do that if I were you. <laughs> I said, well, I, what the hell happened? He said, something happened to that thing you calcined. That back you happened last night. I said, what could have possibly happened? Anyway, I went and talked to the boss. I, I was just horrified uh, if anything had happened. And what had happened was that the, uh, the hot funnel put into this stainless steel can to protect it. The uh, stainless steel can expanded, and the funnel dropped down into the can. And then when everything got cold, the can came down and crushed the uh, Buchner funnel so that it just powdered all that glass. Uh, there wasn't a bit of the material lost, but there were two days lost or one day. And getting that stuff, when I'm sure now it was going to go out to Los Alamos, the first precious uh, batch for cross-section measurements or all kinds of other things. They were dying to get some enriched uranium. They didn't, nobody had grams of it to work with before. So it, it cost at least a day. But uh, all they had to do was to, but they had to dissolve it up, you see, and precipitate it again and calcine it again. So my name was Mud, but uh, all was forgiven. I just felt terrible about it. That's fortunately as close as I came in uh, 40 plus years to getting, getting fired, at least that I know of. <laughs> People uh, uh, sometimes ask me, uh, uh, well, how, how did Oak Ridge, uh, how did you guys in Oak Ridge uh, react to the uh, dropping of the bomb on Hiroshima? Uh, all those casualties. And uh, my answer is that, uh, uh, that uh, we reacted with the same great surprise and, and relief that the rest of the country did. Uh, we had 75,000 people here. I think probably 70, uh, two or 3,000 uh, had no idea of what we were doing here. There are very few people that really understood the whole magnitude of what was going on in Oak Ridge thanks to General Groves' compartmentalization policy, which really did work. Uh, we knew what our jobs were, but we didn't know the whole picture. So the reaction was, uh, uh, my goodness sakes, uh, so this is the vital work we've been doing. Uh, my goodness. 
and, and how relieved I am that it uh, uh, looks like it's going to really have an impact. Uh, I don't see how Japan can continue. Uh, nobody that I know uh, gloried in the deaths of the 100,000 uh, uh, people in Hiroshima any more than they gloried in the deaths of that same number in the bombing of Tokyo, the fire bombing, uh, the night of March the 9th and 10th, when uh, uh, about that same number of people were killed and 16 square miles of uh, downtown Tur Tokyo were burned out uh, compared to the four square miles of Hiroshima. Uh, it was terrible, but uh, the fire bombing of uh, 60 other Japanese cities was terrible too, and Dresden, Germany, that was terrible too. Uh, it was in the context of a war, however, and uh, 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 the uh, uh, relief that we felt uh, turned to exuberant joy just a week later when we uh, woke up to our morning Knoxville newspaper and there was an eight inch high banner headline that said peace. And this blessed peace that we've been praying and working so hard for, for all these years was finally reality. And uh, uh, it seemed very clear to us that uh, the success of the Manhattan Project uh, efforts, the uh, two bombs, uh, the first one of which did not bring the Japanese to surrender. No, it took two of them. But the success of the Manhattan Project uh, is what drove uh, their reluctant Emperor Hirohito to go to his diehard militarists and insist on bringing to an end this war that they started. And that's what we uh, uh, ended up being proud of, and that's what we celebrate today that we had a real role in bringing peace to a world that had been torn uh, by the worst war in history for six long years.